everybody, Beach here. We got another great podcast. I've got my buddy Ted Wright here. He has a company called Fizz, and he's the guy you need to know as far as word of mouth marketing is concerned. And I love word of mouth marketing, and 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 it's one of my favorite topics. And so, I've asked Ted to come talk to us about it. So, Ted, thank you for coming. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate you. And we got some bourbons here. Ted sort of likes bourbons like I do, so we might taste a bourbon or two while we're doing this talk. But uh, but anyway, I think... I'm ready to get into that Elmer T. All right, let's try this Elmer T. All right, let's go. So Elmer T. Lee was the distiller at Buffalo Trace. And um, and so they, they made some, some stuff and put his name on it. Colonel Blanton did, who kind of ran the distiller and decided to to make some of this Elmer T. Lee, and it's sour mash. Sour mash means they take some of the the yeast and um, and, and the, what do you call it? I'm trying to think, like the beer mash, and so they try to help keep it consistent from batch to batch, like in the old days, in the moonshine days, you know, they'd use the same, same batch of yeast, and so today they don't do that all the time, but that's what sour mash means, but tell me what you think. Yeah, so what do you think? So, you know, Blanton's has got a little bit of rye in it. Most people don't think that because Buffalo Trace is mostly a weeded bourbon yep. place, right, with their wellers and their... Dang, this Elmer uh, tea, that's good juice. I think this is outstanding that's, juice. That's good. That's good It's so right daggum hard to get it. So if you get a bottle of that, we want it. You need to call me. I want to buy a bottle too, but it's Elmer T. Lee. It's yep. really, really good. So, Thank cool. you for all the people who do the hard work up there in Kentucky. Make us... Uh, Good go juice. <laughs> so tell me about how'd you get to this thing where you got this company called Fizz? I mean, what was the what was the journey? So um dad was an entrepreneur, granddad was an entrepreneur, um, and so and mom is a scientist, and so I was kind of raised in a house that was like how do things work and why they work that way. Um so I'm off at business school and because I wanted to go and I'd already done a couple companies and sold them and, you know, made a little money. And uh, then I had this idea because I watched Google and TiVo get adopted across my business school campus without any advertising. And I was like, how'd that work? And so I reverse engineered it during my second year and figured it out and then went to my wife who... We've been together since 1987, and this was the super late 90s, so she knew what she had gotten into. Uh, and I said, so I'm going to turn down all these offers from all these places, you know, because I'd gone to a good school and I did real well there and all the rest of that, and I'm just going to do my thing. To which she then goes and gets my acceptance letter from business school, like out of a drawer, and says, let me read the between the lines you. <laughs> this letter says... That you will go here and you will do well, and you did, and you pay us all this money, and then you will work, and your wife will not have to support you because you're some crazy <laughs> entrepreneur. And then she holds me the letter, and I said, that is what that says. So that was the beginning of Fizz, and we knew we needed a new, if I was going to make this thing a success, and I was doing something really new. It's not really new, but it, had, it hadn't really been done in the U.S. since like the 1930s. Right, it's at least thirty five hundred years old, right? Word of mouth marketing is long, and we can go back and we can forever. talk about forever ago. That's how folks did stuff. And then when broadcast got popular, and people were like, "Wow, that's so neat," they went away from the old thing and went to the new thing. Um, and so now you've got half a century of broadcast, and here in the United States, and people are like, "Ah, I've been lied to so many times in this damn thing that I'm just not going to pay attention to it anymore." And so. That was going on. The transition was going on. So our very first client was Paps Blue Ribbon Beer. How did you get Paps Blue Ribbon Beer? Well, so I was looking for a client um, where I, if I if if what I thought worked worked, I wouldn't have to explain what the product was. I could just explain what it what, what how we got it there. Because if I got to explain, you know, ice cube maker machines, and I got to explain how we get there. You know, I'm six or seven minutes into the conversation before I can even get to what's cool and everyone's snored right. or they're gone off. So found this beer and I was looking for a brand. I was looking for something that people already knew about that I could go and I could take. And well, did you I want a brand over. that was not doing so well? No, but you know, look, so I'm this guy, you know, I go to this business school and everyone knows about that school and I go and I'm like, I have a new idea and trust me. 
And they're, uh, they look at me they're like, mm, I don't know, this thing that we've been working well, I mean, you know, why am I going to change? And in fact, the CEO of Pabst Brewing Company, he was interviewing me for, you know, he took my meeting. And about 20 minutes into it, he says, look, I have no idea if you're a genius or an idiot because you got no data behind you. But I give you three markets in two months and you show me what you can do. Did he pay you or did you do it? Oh, no, no, no. He paid me. No, no, no. I mean, he didn't pay me much. I showed up with, you know, four shekels and eight magic beans and said, honey, look, we're on our way. <laughs> and she goes to reach for the letter again. I said, there will be no need for that letter. I heard you. I will well, make this thing work. If not, I'll go get a job tending bar and pouring bourbon for people. I'll, I'll do something. We're fine. Um, and uh, darn if it didn't work. So we're up about 400% in about seven weeks. Now, remember, there wasn't a lot of Paps Ribbon being sold in the United States in like 2001. They were pretty low. I could have funded half of our growth out of my wallet, and I didn't have two nickels to rub together. So they were... PBR was selling so little that the, the folks that measure all their shopper scanner data, they're called IRI. And IRI, if you sell so little, they actually won't tell you how much they so, you sold. So it's You're too like, small. You, too small. I don't even want to mess with counting. And if you actually want an accurate count, we, you got to pay us extra. So they just, it's called an asterisk brand. Like somewhere, somebody went beep it's at least other, once. It's in the other it's in the, Oh, Lord, it, you were lucky if you, if you were doing good if you could get into other. Like all these other little brands. And so, you know, this guy, I mean, literally, so the CEO of the Paps Rearing Company, when he met me, you know, he said, look, I got to go because I got a meeting about television ads for Old Milwaukee. And I'm like, okay. I and mean, that's literally what he did right after he met me. And, you know, we took PBR, me and a guy named Neil Stewart, who worked, uh, he was the inside guy. He was like 23 years old. I was barely 30. And together we did something and we so, took over something. So my understanding was this, some entrepreneur bought all these old brands. Yes. So he had died by the time we got and there. And his like, this 23-year-old guy, though, was that like a nephew or a no, it wasn't. wedding kid? No, it right, so A young marketing kid or what? Yeah, he was, story. He, he was a young marketing kid. So, in fact, his job before that, he had graduated from Southwest Missouri State. And his job before that was literally going to uh, county fairs and taking A1 steak sauce and pouring it on a paper plate and showing how it clinged and see, see how much better this steak sauce is versus the other. I mean, this is his second job. Neil can write in and tell you if it was his second or third job. But it, he he was I think he was he, a rookie. I think Neil was 23. So it's Neil who's like, I want to do this stuff. And there's me who's like, I have a better idea. Come, everybody follow me. And this guy, I mean, so the Pabst Brewing Company owns 42 beer brands and six of the eight malt liquors. Slits, all Milwaukee. Yes. Uh uh, Pearl, um, oh, yeah. oh, uh, Rainier, National Bohemian. Basically, I always say, y'all, I always say it this way. Uh, if you threw it up through your nose in high school or college, Paps really pretty much owned that. And <laughs> and they, you know, uh, they didn't own Rolling Rock. They didn't, didn't own uh, Natty Light. And they or didn't Coors own Or Coors or Miller. Oh, uh, Coors and Miller, that is too fancy, man, this <laughs> stuff. So PBR back then when we started was like, Eight dollars a case, dude. There's water that was more expensive than all of these beers. And so, since you mentioned this beach, um, the Pabst Brewing Company was a financial roll-up of this guy. He went and bought all these brands, sold off all of their assets, and just kept them as a marketing play. And then he died. He had a heart attack one day and just died. Like he'd gotten this whole thing together and it was going down the track. And he was in his shower, and he was dead before he hit the floor. And his wife was like, oh, my goodness, what, what am I, I going to do with this? And then there was some, and this is all public record. Y'all can all look this up. He, in his will, he had left the for-profit company to a non-profit entity. Well, the IRS doesn't like that. Ever since Howard Hughes, there's like, you cannot do that. You can sell the thing and leave the money, but you can't leave a for-profit company in a non-profit shell. Mm. So the IRS said, y'all, you got to sell this thing and, or we need the tax money. And she's like, oh, we barely just got started making any money. We're not making any money yet. And so the IRS gave him seven years 
to get all their affairs in order, unwind it, get it done. And uh, we came in probably about year two and a half of that. So what was the, how do you go through a strategy of how you put this all together? All right. So Beach, what you got to do is you got to think about like all word of mouth marketing, got to think about a three-sided triangle, okay. right? As opposed to a four-sided triangle. <laughs> three-sided triangle. So you got story, you got goal, and you got target. And what okay. you do is you got to have to think about what is your story. So a story is most likely to be shared between two people if it has three qualities. If it's authentic, it's interesting, and it's relevant. Okay. So if it has air, if you like acronyms, yeah. like so if your story has air, folks will share it. Fail on any one of those three, you're no good. They don't share it nearly as much as they do. Like it cuts about 90% of the share out. Wow. So you gotta figure out what your story is, and you gotta figure out who your target is. And your best targets have two qualities to them. They co-locate. So all the moms that drop everybody at the Cub Scout pack or everyone who goes to church or synagogue or everyone who's going to the bar at night or whatever. So they co-locate somewhere either physically or virtually. And they have pre-existing communication networks. What would be an example of that? So that's a text chain. Or it's all my friends on my Facebook group page. Or all my whatever. Everybody, uh, so... Anybody who's watching this, if you turn a wrench and you fix your old, your old, old Porsche by yourself, y'all know something called the Ren List, R-E-N-N-L-I-S-T, the Ren List. Everybody who likes to, has a hobby, turn a wrench and fix old beater Porsches, they go to Ren List, which is literally a listserv. So that technology is probably 40 years old at this point. But that is, if you want to talk to people about old That's Porsches. That's the Bible for those people. That is the Bible for that. And other people want to go to Threads. And other people want to go to Reddit. And other people want to go to Pinterest, Pinterest or wherever they're going. They're congregating virtually. So you got your target. You got your story. And then you got your goal. And the goal is, you know, for y'all at the mortgage company, like, look, we want to generate this many dollars in mortgage in the next two years. Okay, so you got your goal. And then you tie those three sides of that triangle, you tie all that with the piece in the middle, which is activations, right? So what am I going to do? If I want everybody to know about Elmer T, what am I going to do that's going to share that story in such a way that's going to attract people and have them want to come ask us questions. Because even if you and I go to, you know, fancy steak place out here in Alpharetta, and we're sitting there, we don't want somebody to come interrupt us and say, oh, would you like a taste of, you know, no, we already got our drink. But if we're doing some, if we're going to some bourbon tasting festival, or we're, or we're at some liquor store, and some old boy is just sitting over there playing a guitar and got a bunch of bourbon in front of him, eventually one of us is going to go over, somebody's going to go over and say, hey, what are you doing? He's like, well, my granddaddy made bourbon, and so I make bourbon, and I'm just sitting here playing guitar, and anybody wants to taste it, you should taste it. And like, well, I'd taste it, right? Because you don't go up to people. Nobody wants to be interrupted or intercepted, right? Nobody... You know, everybody out there, when y'all go to the airport and that person comes up and says, would you like to buy a credit card? <laughs> like, nobody, nobody goes to the airport to get a credit card, right? That's true. But everybody. Or Harry Krishna. Or works. Harry Krishna or those people that want to spray you at the mall. Like, nobody goes, even if you go to a mall today, most people don't go to be sprayed with something. <laughs> But if you're going for new scent or, you know, ladies, y'all are going for new makeup, you love that the counter's up there and you love you can sample. So you walk over there and you're like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. They're going to talk to me about this stuff and they know everything and they make it real obvious what they're doing over there. But they don't chase me down the street, mm. uh, down the hallway because... I probably don't. So it's kind of got to happen naturally almost is what it's you're saying. It's got to happen organically. And so then does, does the word of mouth piece on the story or whatever, it makes me feel good as the person that can tell you a story about something you don't know yet, right? Or that is true. Like that. And everybody loves to share a story with their friend, or most people love to share a story with their friend. 10% of people out there, 10% of your addressable market for your mortgage company or for Elmer T or for our good friends at Stuckey's, have 10% of that population have these personality traits that really drive them. We call these people advocates. And an advocate has three personality traits that would drive them. 
They like to try new things because they're new. Like, hey, I've never had Elmer tea. Let me try that. They love to share stories with their friends, like three and a half times more than normal. And they're intrinsically motivated. Like, don't, if, if you wearing those Hoka shoes, right? Somebody probably told you about those, right? Some friend right. of yours, if you thought that that friend was bought and paid for, you're like, oh, here's my friend and he's always trying to sell me something and that's his business. It's like going in there and they're trying to sell me Amway. You're like, you don't even want to sit next to them at church. You're like, oh Lord, I'm going to have to buy some more detergent, you know, or something like that. But if somebody shares a story with you and say, no, 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 dude, I mean, I just love these things and this is why I love them. Story shared, if it's authentic, it's interesting, it's relevant. So our camera guy here, y'all, is wearing these fun Chelsea boots. He probably doesn't wear running shoes because he's too hip and cool for that kind of thing. <laughs> so if I knew about these shoes that he, the Beach is wearing, I'm not going to be telling him about the camera guy about it because he doesn't look like he wears this kind of thing. So I'm not going to share the story with him because I don't think he would think it was relevant. It's not interesting to him. It's not relevant to his life. That's beautiful. The advocates in the world, these folks that we were just talking about, on average, their story is shared in excess of 40,000 times in a single year. The other 90% of us who we like to share stories too, but we don't do it nearly as often and our stories don't travel nearly as far, on average, our stories are shared six times in a year. That's a lot of difference. It's a lot of difference. So what you got at Hometown or, or at the Atlanta Braves or Stuckey's is that one North American in 10 tells the other nine of us what, what to buy. And we're like, okay. So how do you find the advocate? So the cool thing is you don't find the advocate, they find you. So how did that happen in PBR? So, well, so they, let's talk about why, just for a second, why okay. they find you, right? So that middle thing, they like to share stories with their friends. Right. So if you like to share stories with your friends, you're always collecting all this other information about stuff you love. So you, I know you, and I know that you really like good bourbon. So, and you might, you and I just had an email exchange with another guy, and you also might like good tequila. But you might not like, you know, barbecue or something, or barbecue sauce or something like that. You're like, nah, it's too sweet for me. I like vinegar or something like that. If I know a lot about barbecue sauce, I'm not going to talk to you about it just because I know you like to put liquids in your mouth right? Or you, let's say you don't like gin. I'm not going to talk to you about gray whale gin. Gray whale gin is fantastic. Everybody should be drinking this stuff. It is the best gin currently in the United States. If I know you don't like gin, I'm never going to talk to you about it. Advocates are trying to have a relationship with people that they already know and make it deeper and make it more meaningful. And mm. they do that by sharing stories with other people they know and sharing stories with them for with about things they think they would like. But they need to know that that person would like that. They do, but most most people in the United States, like 90% of all the conversations people have about stuff that they love, they have them with people they already know. It's not like you and I are walking at the local Publix and some guy jumps out and goes, Jim, peanut butter's awesome! And just like runs away. Right? Because you're like, well, that was weird, you know, and eventually that Publix manager is going to get mad. But if, you know, if I know you're a big runner and I know that Jif is super great for runners or this protein bar is super great for runners, I'm going to tell you about that. You're going to share. But my friend, you know, who doesn't run, who does something else, I'm not, or is allergic to peanuts, I'm never going to tell them about that because that's completely irrelevant to the life and it is uninteresting to them. So how did, so back to PBR, how did you figure out who the, I mean, how did you figure out what to do next, I guess? All right, so what's next? So I'm just trying to use that as an idea so somebody can plug that in with their business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so keep me on the track here because, you know, you and I, <laughs> we don't have a our track. stories don't meander. We don't have a track. We don't have a track. All right, well, the, the, the camera guy's got to say, go to the track, the triangle, this side. All right. So you think you got story, you got target, you got goal, you got activation in the middle. So you got it when, when somebody's building this for their own business, they got to think about, we think you th should think about story first, mm -hmm. but really you think about story and target at the same time. So here's PBR. So the reality of PBR as a beer is it's, it's okay, but it ain't anything to write home about. Right. Right. You know, in the world of beverages, there are, there are, 
outside the can brand or outside the bottle brands and there's inside the bottle brands. You and I know bourbon pretty well. We know that Elmer T is an inside the bottle brand. This is good juice. There's other stuff out there. Uh, uh, screwball, as an example, right. the peanut butter flavored vi uh, uh, bourbon whiskey. whiskey. It's lovely tasting, but that's really an outside the bottle brand. That's not, nobody is like, mm, I get notes of, you know, it's dude, somebody <laughs> put peanut butter flavor in low end whiskey. I mean, look, that's what they did with Fireball. This is same the, thing. That whiskey, before people sold that to pe people, uh, they that whiskey is good for pigs. Yeah. I mean, they, they put that in feedstock. Yeah. And they're like, ah, I think we can put more. Let's just dump a bunch of stuff in there and a bunch of cinnamon, and folks won't taste it, and <laughs> let's drink it. And it's super delicious. Right. Right? But, you know, it ain't, you're not going to win any amazing awards and change somebody's life by tasting that where this Elmer tea, you're like, oh, darn, I turns out that I do like bourbon. All right, so what you got to think about for, for PAPS, for PBR, is we're like, okay, who's the target? So if you take people, in the, if you take society in the United States, and you break it down all the way back from World War II forward, you basically move in 20-year cycles okay. that are each contradictory to one another. Okay. So everyone comes back from World War II, and that was terrible and everyone's dying and it smells like blood and poop and men are coming back. They're like, I don't ever want to do that again. So no more chaos in my life. So they come back and they're like, let's go work for IBM and let's all wear the same hat. And there's a, there is a book about that time called the man in the gray flannel suit. Like we're all going to do the same thing. We're going to vote Eisenhower Republican. We're going to wear cloth coats. We're going to do all this. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So about 20 years of that going on, and these kids start being raised by those families. And like, I don't know, I'm feeling a little restricted. So like 1965 shows up, 1945, 1965 shows up. They're like, the age of Aquarius. <laughs> and we're like, all right. And I'm like, woo. And it's Woodstock, and it's music, and it's long hair. And we're, gonna, we're going, ugh, we're gone. And so that goes until like middle 1980s and people are like, oh God, are you kidding me? You know, Studio 54 and I mean, they literally it was a moon, the symbol for Studio 54. Y'all should look this up. The symbol for Studio 54 with a, was a moon and a cocaine spoon and cocaine in there. I mean, that was the actual symbol in the that. nightclub. Yeah, yeah. Y'all go look up there. So, so everybody, like all great political movements start with a philosophy and they end with a costume. So think about so think about that. So think about That's middle cool. of nineteen eighties, right? Yeah. People are like, okay, so middle nineteen sixties, people are like, oh my god, this is a thing. And by the middle of the nineteen eighties, they're like, whoa, we got to come around. So Reagan shows up, gets elected in eighty, yeah. And a guy comes back, a guy named Hal Rainey comes back with a campaign in eighty four, and he said, it's it's morning in America, and so we're gonna get rid of all this drug stuff we've been doing and all this hippie stuff and all this do whatever you want and we're gonna sit up as my mother used to say sit up and fly right and so you've got like the preppy handbook you've got all these brands start showing up sebago uh the financial times people uh, get a subscription to the new yorker they start playing squash they cross polo. pins polo like all the rest of that stuff shows up so so that's 1980s, and it goes into the 1990s. And so, so if you're born in 1980, you're like 20 years old by the time like 2000 rolls around. And you're like, gosh, you know, divorce rate's still 50%, and dad worked his whole life at this place, and all of a sudden they offshored his job, and now he doesn't have anything to do. And I think, and you watch Dynasty on TV, and the, all these ladies with the ton of makeup and the hair and the big old shoulder pads, and like, ah, this seems like nonsense to me. I'm going to go over in this direction. So that's right around the time that we took over Paps Ribbon. And that direction is really called, so that is called hipsterism. And hipsterism really starts as a political movement in the late 1990s when people are looking around at all these generations that have come before them and said, y'all are all about stuff and that didn't seem to work out very well for y'all and you spend a lot of money on this stuff and then nobody cares about the stuff and you gotta get new stuff, seems like a hamster wheel and so we're gonna blow this whole thing off. 
So thanks, Mom and Dad, for sending me to four years to Emory or Williams or University of Georgia or wherever you send them. But I'm going to stick a bone through my nose and I'm going to move to New York City. I'm going to be a bike messenger because I'm not going to live for stuff. I'm going to live for experiences. So here's, and there's a woman who wrote a book called No Logo. Her name's Naomi Klein. And I had read No Logo and she published that in 97. So I've been thinking about this and I'm reading Seth Godin and, you know, Purple Cow. And I'm thinking what about a great book. Right, oh my God. Purple Cow. Seth knows. Hi, Seth. Seth changed my life. If I ever make any money, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy a house. I'm just going to va my vacation house. If I ever make enough money at a vacation house, I'm going to call it Purple Cow. That's awesome. And you know, everyone names their vacation house like That's one of my Laguna, Laguna Leaves or, or Sunshine Breezes. I'm gonna like, nope, this is Purple Cow. That was cool before the Blue Ocean Strategy. That was <laughs> cool before the Blue Ocean Strategy. So here we are in the early 2000s and we're like, all right. So we got all these people and they're looking for some meaning. They're looking for an experience. Well, PBR had been around forever and it was an okay beer, but it's in all of these, it's in all these bars that basically sell cheap liquor. Well, if you're about the experience and not about the stuff and you still want to go, want to get your swerve on, you're going to low end bars because they sell dollar beers and $2 shots of wild turkey. So we're like, all right, so let's go there. Other thing you got to remember about everybody is everybody likes to be recognized for who they are and everybody likes to be loved. So we're like, all right, who really cares about PBR on these bars? And this is, you know, our camera guy's got, hi camera guy, our camera guy's got good tattoos, but in the late 90s, early 2000s, the only people who had tattoos were people who had been in the military, people who had been in prison, and people who were in a Japanese gang called the Yakuza. Not a whole lot of other people had tattoos. They weren't really running around. So, but, and all these bars are lots of folks that had tattoos because it was just, and we're like, tell us more about that. And so we knew, I learned a lot about Sailor Jerry. So who was a very early tattoo artist in the 1940s. And they're like, that's so cool. So we started going to tattoo conventions in like 2002. And y'all look at me here. I mean, do I look like I belong at a tattoo convention? I don't. So I played up that fact, and in the beer business, you wear just shirts just like Beach has, except instead of saying his mortgage company, you just put the brand of your beer there. And so we walked around in these super cool, everyone's got tattoos, everyone's doing all this stuff, big mustaches, and I went intentionally, and Neil Stewart did too, we wore polo shirts with a Paps logo and khaki pants and tennis shoes. And we looked completely out of place. We looked like we were narcotics officers looking to bust somebody. In fact, had people come up, are y'all narcs? Nope, we work for the Pabst Brewing Company. And we said it just like that. And like, PBR is like, yeah, 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 you've heard of it. And, oh, yeah, I love drinking that. Why are y'all here? Well, so our brand is about doing stuff because we want to do it. And it's just, and I know it doesn't make sense in the world of, you know, Michelob Ultra and all this other stuff. We're making the same beer we've been making for a hundred years, but we like it. And so we heard y'all like it. So we thought we'd come on and check y'all out and see what else you like. And they're like, so tell us about these tattoos or tell us about these BMX bikes that you take and take apart and uh, clad in gold and put them back together and ride around the neighborhood. Tell us about all of these cool things that you're doing. And people would be like, oh, you see me. They didn't really say you see me, but they're, they're like, oh my gosh, well, let me tell you about gardening or orchids or tattoos or whatever. So these people are like, oh my gosh, you see me, you like me, you're giving a you care. You recognize me. You recognize me, you're giving a care about what who we are as people. Sure, next time I'm in there, these beers are a dollar, I'll drink one of your beer. And so all the cool kids start drinking the beers. And then all this, then you go out with all the people who want to be cool. And then there's the me's of the world and like, well, I'll do, I'll wear whatever shirt I need to wear to meet the ladies or whatever beer I need to be drinking. That's the one I'm going to be drinking. And they told two people and so on and so on. So, and we were, and we relied on people sharing the story as my friend Rashad Tobacco Walla just was talking about at this point in the game in the United States, you do not market to people, you market through people. So you have really great hats that you give away to your friends. Don't sell them for $20. You give them away and you say, hey, if you'll wear my hat, that's great. And you spend a lot of money. 
They cost you $20 to make. These are a good hat. These are not cheap promo hats. So they'll wear. Yeah, so they'll wear. And then somebody says, well, what the hell is a hometown mortgage? And you're like, I see you wearing that hat. Well, let me tell you, my buddy Beach, and he's the nicest guy, and you got to get a mortgage anyway, so you might as well get it from him and good rates, and his son works there, and he'll take care of you, and he's a nice guy. And they call you, and they say, hey, my friend Tom was wearing your hat, and he said, you're a good guy, and so let me talk to you for a second. And if the experience of working with hometown matches the story they're told, then they'll just Boom. buy from you. And then they'll tell somebody else, hopefully. Well, they will as long as, ex ex they as, long as the story is authentic, it's interesting, and it's relevant. So people who love hometown mortgage don't ever, they don't just walk down the street and say, hey, two guys walking with hometown mortgage. You know, but their friend who's talking to them at church or, you know, or at, at golf ball range field or, or whatever. ball field, or whatever, like, oh, yeah, my son's moving to town. He's got to buy his first new house. And he's like, you know, just got out of school a couple of years ago. And he's like, have you met my friend Beach at hometown? He would be perfect. Send John over there. And that's, and they tell two friends and so on and so on. And 10% of people will make it their business in life to tell everybody that they know that this works for them. And the other 90% of us will just happen to mention when we see it. So how do you work on your story? So story is Here, tough, y'all. All, sip, All right, let's go. All stop. right, well, now we're having fun. <laughs> All right, so you got to be really hard on yourself about your story. Okay. So you got to be authentic, Okay. got to be interesting, and you got to be relevant. Okay. So here's, I'll do tricks and tips for each one of those three. Authenticity. Truth is the language of lawyers and politicians. Authenticity is the language of friends. So politicians and lawyers will always say things that you're like, mm, I don't know, but they don't say anything that's a lie. It just, they might shade the heck out of it, but your friend is going to have language you're going to say, you know, Steve, I, you know, I don't know about those shoes, dude. You know, maybe, maybe, I don't know. They're a little tall for you. They're, they're a little rainbow. They're for ugly you. looking. Or they're ugly looking or whatever. You're like, oh, they're comfortable. I'll get out and I'm, and you're like, well, my feet are all the time. Well, I tell you what, you get you a pair and if you don't like them, I'll buy them from you because I love these things and we're the same size and I, I love these things so much I run out of them. The guy puts them on his feet and he's like, oh, these are the most comfortable thing I ever said. I was like, there you go. You're done. So got to be authentic, right? So you got to, if, if you, can you talk about your product or service as a friend would mm -hmm. to somebody else? Is it important to know what other people are already saying about you? Nope. Doesn't matter? Well, I mean, you know, if they're, if you're so much and then, then, but you know, maybe that's your thing is like, oh, you know, I'm hard to deal with, but I'll give you the best price. <laughs> You no, know, but I mean, people in the community are saying, oh, there's, you know, that company's this way and that way and they're good stuff. Is it to your advantage to pick up the language that's kind of, I call it the buzz that's already out there about you? Sure. Because less work for it, yourself, more, more money for you. Yeah. Work, work, work smarter, not harder. If everyone's already saying, hey, these, you know, fizz, they sure are creative. Great. And as long as you get Ted, with a couple of bourbons in him, he'll just, you know, he'll give you a good go discount. Forever. He'll go forever. <laughs> right? Right. Picking up on it is fine, but you can also start stuff. You can't really start stuff out of whole cloth, mm -hmm. right? Because when you started hometown, I assume you had a way that you wanted to be. Right. Right. And that probably came out of your personality. Like, right. I like to do this versus that. And so you did a lot of that. Right. And you found people who like that versus the other thing. And so they're like, all right, you're my guy. So you did, then you just keep building on that. Mm -hmm. Like at our shop, you know, we were pretty creative and we, people like us because we're quote outside the box thinkers, but we're not outside the box thinkers. We just like the, the jo our job is to help you sell more stuff to more people more often for more money. That's our job. So we don't care about anything else, but the job. So the Atlanta Braves called and said, hey, we'd like your brand to be a part of our, you know, billboard and buy a thing out in center field. I'm like, great. 
how much, how much does it cost and how much money you think that'll make you, us? Well, I'm like, no, no wells. That's my answer. That's my two questions. How much does it cost and how much money do you think I can make? That's, and that's, and that's a great question. And that's, and for us, for all the, you know, when we're doing all this stuff for our clients, that's, that's all we're thinking about. Do you give them that? Do you try to give them that up front? We think if you engage us, this is where we can take you and this is where the profit will be. Yeah. So at this point, we've been doing this for 22 years for us. So I've got reams of data. So I know that like every dollar that you give us, if you'll stick with us two years or more, we'll return $6.2 to you in EBITDA for every dollar you give us. Why would and, anybody not take you up on Oh, that? well, you know, there's all kinds. Because talking. it's in left field for some people. Well, you know, so you got a lot of stuff going on. I mean, I got a friend of mine, and he runs a very big enterprise, and he's like, Ted, you know, I have a huge budget, but, you know, I also sponsor, you know, global soccer events, and I we, we do movie premieres for James Bond for the next five years, and we already signed the deal. So even though my budget is big, a lot of it is already taken up. Um, and there's also inertia, and there's also, you know, other agencies. I mean, y'all, any of y'all out there just know that all your agencies, especially your big agencies, you know, they, whatever you say you want, they'll say they can do for you. And that's just, that's just, that's just how they are. And Lord love them, and they've been very successful for a very long time, but... Um, but they're safe at this point for some people, right? Yeah, it's safe, and no one ever got fired. I mean, I have a friend of mine, and he runs a, a another big enterprise, and he says, Ted, you know if, like, China invades Taiwan and they close the South China Sea, my board, when I find don't make my numbers, my board is going to say, well, if you just run more Super Bowl ads. <laughs> It's you the know. safe thing for the big guys, right? It is a safe. So is it is sort of like an entrepreneurial type organization better for you? Uh, no, 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 no. We only really work with the big guys. You want now. the big guys? Well, well, not well. They want us because you know just just to talk about us for a second, y'all, and then we'll get back to y'all. Um, at this point, there's no CMO. There's no CMO in America that thinks broadcast is working better for them now than it was two years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. So they're looking for other outlets. They're looking for other stuff because social media was this big promise and now that's a dumpster fire. And, 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 if it, and if it's not a dumpster fire, it's mostly fraud. I mean, the Association of National Advertisers just came out with something that they think almost 60% of all the digital numbers that you see, like I have 3.2 million followers or we got 60,000 views. Over 60% of those numbers are fake. And this is not a rip on Kim Kardashian, but if somebody said Kim Kardashian has 30 million followers, she probably has in reality somewhere between 14 and 16 million people, which is a bunch of people. Yay, Kim, go, you do you. But that's kind of what Elon, I mean, uh, yeah, Elon was about on Twitter, right? Was how much of this stuff is real and how much of it's not, right? The bots and yes, all that. He was on to that. So he is definitely talking about that. Um, and I tell you, I saw something interesting. Interpol... You know, the big the inter-European, they say the number two revenue producer for criminal gangs, like drug cartels and like the big or criminal organizations, their, their number one is still drugs. Their number two revenue producer is digital fraud now. That's how much fraud there is. So when these CEOs and these big CEOs and CMOs put all this money into this digital stuff and they don't see the numbers move, they're like, wait, what? what? what's going on? And originally, oh, creative must be bad, or strategy must be bad. And then they start digging into the numbers like, this is a lot of fake. Like, um, oh gosh, uh, the guy who is the CMO of Procter & Gamble, I forget what, Mark Proctor, I think that's right. Mark just was out at the, the big marketing conference, like the big global marketing conference and said, look y'all, you either got to get this straight or we got to go do something else. Like literally, like we just, we're sticking a bunch God, of money. Marketing is everything for those guys. Isn't yes. It? Yes. It's everything. So at this point, and thank you for asking about us. So at this point, like we don't really have, well, that's not true. We save one spot a year for one entrepreneurial company 
most of the people who, most of those at this point are people that I know that are like, hey, will you do this? Because a very entrepreneurial, younger company is very different than like a Apple or Audi so or it's, some it's, of our other clients. From your standpoint, it's better to have an already known brand and try to enhance it than it is to take somebody that doesn't know that people don't know and bring it up. Which, um, which one's easier? Uh, it, you know what? That is a great question, Beach. Um, it is not about size. It is about what is the quality of your story. So back to story. That's the hardest thing to do, right? People it is. Come, because you're inside looking out. Yep. I struggle with that all the time. So there's authentic. Now let's do interesting. So interesting, I got a test for you to do. Okay. So think about what your story is that you're telling people. And then close your eyes and imagine you are at brunch with somebody that you love. Okay. And you have invited another couple. All right. And they have invited a couple and y'all don't know them. Okay. Okay. So there's six of y'all sitting at brunch and imagine you start telling your story. When you're telling your story, is the person you love, do they give you what in our house that we known as the spousal eye roll? <laughs> for the, you know, nobody wanted the pecan salesman <laughs> at brunch. Or is it, I, I did not know that about those shoes. Really? You're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Average word of mouth conversation in the United States, 32 seconds long. So it's quick. So it's quick. It's it. Is it an elevator speech? It, it, it is. Uh, elements of it. It is. But well, it's not necessarily always authentic in the way you would discuss it with a friend. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, elevator pitches, elevator pitches are a pitch. Like I have you trapped in this, in this space and we have two and a half minutes and you will be out of basically politeness and social cur courtesy. You will listen to me because you only know it can only last two and a half minutes because <laughs> this door opens and I'm out. <laughs> Right? right, right. So that's an elevator pitch. This is a sharing between two people who already know each other. I so that. for that's interesting, you, we call it the office, we call it the brunch test. Like literally think about that. And it's a really interesting thought experiment for y'all at hometown. Like, okay, if I was at brunch and I don't know these people, like a third of the table, I so don't know So how do I them. explain my story to somebody when there's somebody else standing there that's checking me off about... Bullshit, or that's a great or, story. Or, yeah, oh, I didn't know. or also just doesn't want to be, I mean, you're all hosting a social event and nobody was there to be sold on mortgages or Paps Ribbon or Elmer T or this camera over here, whatever's going on. But there, is the story interesting enough to where you can break through all that and be like, huh, I did not know that there are six times the number of antioxidants in a pecan that there are in a blueberry. So I should be eating pecans instead of blueberries. And in fact, if I can do blueberry pecan pancakes, then <laughs> I'm like, then you'll be healthy and live to be a thousand. <laughs> Lord help us all. <laughs> right? So authentic, interesting, and then the third piece is relevant. Dude, that, that's a game changer for me right there. The interesting game part? Changer. Yeah, because that'll help me start thinking about how I would tell somebody that at brunch. That's... <laughs> that's my man, that was I'm, awesome. I'm glad to help. All right, so I'm glad to help. That's a great. I said like, that's just awesome. All right, so then you were talking about in the middle of the triangle. Activations. All right, so just from hometown's perspective, so I don't even know what your story is, right? But whatever your story is, you got to say, okay, what can I do out in the world, physically or virtually, that people can notice? but I'm not running up to them, right? You never interrupt somebody and you never intercept somebody. Okay. Right? We were talking about jumping out at somebody at the Publix and yelling about Jeff Peanut Butter and we were talking about trying to sell you an American Express card at the Atlanta airport, right? Classic interruption, classic interception. Okay. I mean, literally the people in the airport is like, I'm going from security to the gate and you're literally standing in the way, in my way and I have to walk around you. Like if you want um, any airport you want to go to, next time you see where, the, um, where those little credit card people are, look down at the floor and look at the wear pattern or the dirt pattern. And what you're going to find is it's a straight line down the middle of the hallway and there's a big bow around where that thing is because people are like, to and they're literally walking around it, right? Because people don't want to be intercepted and they don't want to be interrupted. 
So what things can you do out there that can attract people's attention and let them come and ask you a question? So like I got this old 66 red pickup truck. Yep. It's logoed on the side, says hometown mortgage. Yep. I, I, I get more people walk up to me based on that. Yep. So is that a good, does that? Yeah, well, because then, you know, ideally then you can talk a bit to them about somehow there's some analogy between uh, 66 Ford? Chevy. 66 Chevy pickup and what you do at hometown mortgage. Like, yeah, I like these. And, you know, I'm just about, look, I, I hey, think. this truck's old and beautiful like us. We've been in, we're the oldest mortgage company in Alpharetta, so I wanted an old truck. Yep. Kind of let everybody know we've been around a while. Yep. And I like driving it, and I like three on the floor, three, three on the column, and, yeah. and you know. On the tree. Three on the tree. Three on the tree. There you go. I like that. And so let me go, and, and so I did that. And people, and you probably, I mean, if, if I was running hometown, I would make sure that I was going to the gas station every Saturday. I'd go several times to the gas station, and I'd go to different gas stations, and I'd just make sure because at a gas station, you're already sitting there. And somebody else is already sitting there. So you, got, you like lines. You get a chance to have a conversation. And somebody says, so what year is that? Well, 6'6". Six, six. Well, that's fun. You like driving? I do. And, you know, when you cling, 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 and eventually somebody's going to say, well, what's that? Well, we're the oldest mortgage company here in Alpharetta. We've been here since half these things are dirt roads. And, you know, and, uh, yeah, if you ever need something, you know. here. Give me a call. Yeah, my name's Steve, and, you know, here's my card, and let's go. Man, I feel better about buying that truck already. Oh my God. <laughs> that, that truck did, and I do, and I'd be in parades. I mean, if anybody ever needed being a Cub Scouts, Fourth of July, Ain't whatever enough. you're doing, let's I'll take you and and Lord help you, don't be passing out flyers around that thing. That's Somebody bad. asked you for one, fine. But if they see you're like, oh, it's that Steve, he's gonna send me another piece of paper that I just gonna have to throw away. Right? There is no more smarter, more intelligent buyer of products and services in the world than people who live in the United States. We get hit with 14,000 commercial messages a day. A day. A day. Nobody accidentally buys anything in America. You don't go to the Publix and come back and say, oh my gosh, what is it? Four different Yellowbird hot sauces. How did these get in my bag? You said, oh, yellow birds. Somebody told me about these and I like super spicy. And so let me get this thing and let me get one of these. And well, I don't know. I like hot sauce. So let me get all three. Right? Nobody accidentally buys stuff. So by chasing people physically or virtually and making sure they understand like all the story, you're basically telling other people that you're too dumb to remember. So I need to make sure that you do. All right, so how, where does video come into play with that? People doing videos or stuff on the internet. Is that any good? Sure, it's awesome. Right, again, again. But you don't want to, you don't want to push yourself on the people. Well, you know. Or do you have a call to action? Uh, sure, if you want to. Remember, so it's less about pre-being prescriptive and say, is your video authentic? Is it interesting? And is it relevant? So y'all, Steve and I are about the same age. So do you remember a guy called Crazy Eddie? Crazy Eddie had a stereo store in New York City. Uh -uh. And he had these ads. He's like, I'm Crazy Eddie and my prices are insane. And he would like smash things and he'd say, $99. No, smash, $89. You know, come on down. I only got, I have one less than I used to have. Come on down. I'm Crazy Eddie, right? And it was just insane. And people were like, okay. I've never seen somebody do that on TV, so I'm going to pay attention to that. And other people have different types of ads than nobody ever, you know, extra came in the store. So your job is not to think about what is the channel. All the channels are great. Do skywriting. Wear a clown nose everywhere. Do whatever it is that you're going to do. Be authentic in your messaging. Be interesting and be relevant. How you do that, who cares? That's an awesome line. That's just great. Just do your thing. That's great. Do your thing. All right. You need to drink some of that because I got to get some of this other. But tell us right. about Stuckies. Well, 
as we have some of these. They are maple. Maple. Mm. Those are good. They are good. <laughs> actually, actually, it's terrible. My favorite ones are, um, I just got a shipment to the house, and uh, they only put one bag of my favorites in there because my wife called and said, don't keep sending these. And I, them all. I, and I ate them. I, I was going to bring them to you. And I was like, I came back from the pool the other day, and I was like, mm, I could use some kettle glazed pecans right about now. <laughs> they were gone. 20 minutes later. Tell us all about it. All right. So, for y'all don't know, Stuckey's is a pecan company started in the 1930s by... So it's family-owned business, third generation, owned by now by a woman named Stephanie Stuckey. And this old boy down south Georgia is has a pecan farm, and he decides instead of just selling pecans to folks, they do some. He's gonna make some pecan candy because they just cut a highway not far from him, and people are driving from you know up in the north down to Florida, you know, to Go get right out of the way. Right by his house, so to speak. Drove right by, like. Let's put up a shack. And dang if the candy wasn't good. Aren't these things good? Mm-hmm. I'm serious, dude. I'm <clears throat> over the top, dude. I had to I had to ban these. <coughs> I had to ban You're gonna have to bring some more of these back. I will. I had to ban these from meetings that we have down there because I came home one day and I was like, I think I just consumed four thousand calories of pecans <laughs> at this meeting. I, I can't do that. I mm. that's I gotta go run seventy miles just to get even again. I'm <laughs> a long way. So so it goes and the guy who started it is big and by the nineteen seventies, you know, he's got four hundred roadside stands all across America. Selling a lot of stuff. Well, you know, his son gets involved and his son gets involved in lots of other stuff and Stuckey's is not necessarily the focus and so they sold it to somebody else and they kind of ran it into the ground. So Stephanie just bought it back. Stephanie Stuckey just bought it back about three and a half years ago. And so I'm involved in the company. And a guy named R.G. Lamar is involved in the company. And then there's Stephanie. So it's the three of us. And we've got a bunch of employees at this point. So stop. How did you meet Stephanie and how did you, how did you become somebody? So that... I have an office. So y'all, um, we're, in, we're both here in Atlanta. And um, I have an office more in town a little bit in a little town called Decatur, which is also the home, little hometown that I grew up in. And just one day, you know, knock on the door. Now, nobody knocks on our door. It's not people drive by and say, oh, word about marketing. I need Irk. Let me stop and get some, you know, before I go into, uh, before I, you know, head off to dinner. Man. So nobody, I know, right? I'm serious. I'm serious. These things are good. Can't eat just one. You cannot eat just one. So I talked to Stephanie. So Stephanie knocks on the door. Um, we'll never open the door for other people. I mean, everyone has their own key. And, you know, if somebody's knocking, it means that something's going on. Something's happening. So, but somebody in our office happened to be walking by. He says, you know, can I help you? Not the first person who's ever just knocked on our door randomly and, you know, we know how to, I'm sorry, you know, we're, we don't have any, you know, whatever you're looking for. <laughs> Go ahead and feel free to move on. And she's like, does Ted Wright work here? And I was, and they were like, well, man, as you thought. And they said, she said, Stephanie Stuckey. And the door was open and I happened to be walking by going to go grab my lunch. And I said, Stephanie Sucky, like Sucky's back when I was in Boy Scouts. And she like li re like looked over the person who she was talking to and said, yes, that's me. That's my grandfather and my dad. And I was like, well, I'm just about to have lunch. I think we have an extra Chick-fil-A. Come on in. And so I figured, you know, I'm eating my lunch. You know, sure. Why not? Come on in. I figured 30 minutes. How long is this going to take? So two and a half hours later. I, we got the whiteboard out, and I pulled a couple of people in my office, and I'm super interested. And she's like, Boom. well, how, how much does all this cost? And I was like, <laughs> way more than you can afford. I love you, but you just told me your story. You cannot afford <laughs> us. And she's like, well, can I call on you again? And I was like, sure. You know, we're all, you know, if you're from Atlanta, I'll be glad to give a helping hand when I can. And, and so uh, then she eventually asked me to be on the board, and then she asked me to help a little bit more and then there was an investment opportunity and so now there's three of us and uh, 
we are growing the thing and we have expanded greatly in the last three and a half years since I've been involved and um, we're all very happy about it. And it's available all across America at this point. You know, we got all the big retailers calling on us or we're already there. Like y'all down in Florida, they're all over Wawa. Um, if y'all know Pilot Truck Stops, we're in some, the Planogram set just came out and we're in there very prominently. And we have distributors and going all the trade shows and it's just, it's good. And those, so we really sell two things. We're famous for our pecan log rolls, but I love the pecans and so does RG and so does Stephanie. But, you know, she, there's a lot of nostalgia around the candy side of this. But these pecans, y'all, I mean, the candy I can eat maybe, I mean, because it's a lot of sugar for me. Right. So I can do the candy a couple times a year. You know, I can eat, no, I can go through, I personally, I can go through a bag of these a week easy, if not a couple. I don't know about a day. <laughs> y'all, we're about to be done with these. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Don't look at the calorie count on the back. We're Do we right. sell a party pack of those where I can we, like buy a big pack and put them in a bowl for a party? Yep. We do. I'm going to need to do that. We do. Oh, yeah. Oh, they'll go so fast. Huh. And well, how, do I, how do I buy that? Do so, I have to go to a retail store? Can I order them online? Or? We're in, we're in 4,000. Well, that's not true. We're in 5,000 stores across America. So HEB and Publix and Kroger and... They got that. All kinds of other stuff. Or you can go on Stuckies.com and order and order and ship them right to your house. That's what I'm going to do. Y'all need to do that. That's true. They're good. As a tailgate food. Mm. Oh. We've right. got we've got people that are starting to. I want, I want you to taste this oh. bourbon. Oh, right, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is my favorite bourbon. This is your favorite? Revival. Mm-hmm. So this guy's got a distillery down in Charleston called High Wire Distillery. Oh, I'm not, I don't know this. Now, so, since we're talking bourbon, yeah. is he really making it or is he buying it from somebody else? And My understanding is he's making it. All right. Okay. I've been down there and there's a lot of there's a lot of equipment. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy was making bourbon, but he decided I'm gonna just give you a little bit. No, right. he decided that he wanted to start a, a series of like go back to the past revival type ideas of whiskey and stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. he's got one that's uh, sorghum. He make, makes it out of sorghum, whiskey out of sorghum. Really? So anyway, the story I've been told is that this guy goes to, uh, starts looking around and hears about moonshiners. And he starts talking about moonshiners. Okay. And hears about this moonshiner there in the low lowlands of uh, South Carolina. And he goes to see this one moonshiner. He gets there, knocks on the door. The wife comes to the door and he says, hey, I hear Jimmy makes really good moonshine. And she said, well, he did. He passed. And he goes, oh man, I really wanted to taste his moonshine and okay. all. And so she said, what was special about his moonshine? And she said, well, he used, he used his grandfather's Jimmy red corn. We called it Jimmy red corn. Okay. And basically the story was that back his, this particular African American guy, his great grandfather, who was a slave or mm -hmm. great great grandfather, you know, and in and in the slave days, the yellow and the white corn the family ate, and then the Indian corn is what you fed to the livestock, and so the slaves would get pieces of that, take it back, and make liquor with it, because nobody was really missing it. Was kind of the way I heard the story. Okay, okay. So he says to her, he says, "Well, do you have any ears of that, or do you grow it anymore?" She says, "No, we quit growing it since he passed, but I saved two ears." So he said, can I have one? So she gave him an ear. He took it to the University of South Carolina to mm -hmm. the Ag Department and said, yep. can you regrow this? Yeah. What is this? Heirloom okay. corn. Yep. So now Jimmy Red Corn is being grown all over. They got hundreds of acres down there. You go to Charleston, you get Jimmy Red Corn grits, Jimmy Red Corn cornbread. They're using it all over down there. Really? This is the only bourbon that I, there's a couple, but there are very few that are 100% corn. There's no wheat, there's no rye. This is like old time stuff. This is like made moonshine because bourbon is basically moonshine and it turns brown when it sits in the barrel. Right. And so, and so this is basically in my mind kind of like what it was. They made, they made, you know, this moonshine up in Kentucky. They put it in these barrels like Elijah Craig took pickle barrels and charred them to get the pickle out and they sent them down the river to New Orleans. And by the time they got down there, they were brown. They were right? brown. And you know that's why it's called bourbon, right? Yes. 
because it said Bourbon County on it. And so when they floated all the way down, they just, instead of calling it whiskey from Bourbon County, it eventually, they just called it bourbon. So Bourbon was an area of Kentucky that the Bur Bur Bourbon family from France kind of kind of controlled and founded. And then later on when it became a state and they broke them up in counties, okay. they actually ended up with a Bourbon County. But anyway, I mean, that, that that's basically all right. But the cool thing to me is this is the way it used to taste. Right. Now and tell it me has what a, you think. It's sort well, of red. You can tell it's a little redder. It is a little bit more red. And um, it's and it's a little it's 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 a little uh, it's got more of a kick to it. Well, it has a very specific. Look at that. Look at that. Maybe not too far. Hold off. on. Let me float. Let me float. But this is more else. gold. Yeah, hundred percent. Hundred percent. They're different colors. Hundred percent. They're different colors. Um, that's interesting. This is. So I'm not going to tell no secrets, but so I was in a scout troop here in Atlanta and uh, we might have gone down to our scout master's <laughs> house in South Georgia and there might have been some moonshine. There might have been something might have there, been. might have been unclear to tell. There were so many 30 odd six being shot off there and shotguns. It's hard to remember. Um, that is that. So that's a hundred percent corn. Now, talking no about a wheat. story, that's no a, rye. For knowing that you like bourbon, that's why I picked it. Yep, I appreciate that. So I can that. tell you a story of something maybe you'd never heard before. I've never heard that. It's not that hard to find, but it's not easy to find. Okay. I tell a lot of people about it. So my, my Red's liquor store here in Alpharetta, he carries it pretty regular. And I asked him the other day, I said, you sell a lot of that Jimmy Red corn? He goes, yeah, I don't know why, but we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I'm... Telling everybody. You're sharing the story, and the story matches the experience people have. And they want that experience, and they like to share the story, and so they'll go buy it. It's why these folks, it's why these Makers folks Mark. Did, the, did the red wax. Well, well you know why she did? Mm. So, Mr. Samuels. Yes. Makers Mark. They used her bread recipe and yeast when he started making his whiskey and they grew red wheat on his farm is and nobody and that red. and that's well the red wheat is why the maker's mark has a little different taste than like a weller's that's a weeded it's a little maker's mark to me tastes a little more rye it's got a yeah, little yeah. bit more of a kick right yeah 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 because it's red red wheat and it's redder like this jimmy red corn that's mm -hmm. not, and not golden but Miss Samuels thought that the cognac bottles and were, were really pretty and how they put the wax over them. And so they decided to wax their Maker's Mark thing. That way she was the one that influenced that. So I bought these. You go to Maker's Mark, everything you buy up there in the store, you can dip it in the red wax. Oh. So, I, so I bought four of these and <laughs> dipped them in the red wax and made them a little different. Oh, that's fun. That was pretty cool. That is super cool. So... Are people not taking advantage of word of mouth marketing like they should? Is it a huge, uh, like, hey, wake up, people. You need to start thinking about this. So I, more and more people are coming to me now and asking me that. And more and more people are calling us directly. I mean, look. 20 years ago, I was like, follow me. And all I heard was crickets. Yeah. And my wife with that piece of paper, you know, <laughs> pointing at the lines. And then, of course, we got pregnant. And then I was like, oh, sweet now Jesus. double down. There, like, stroke, stroke, <laughs> go, go, Yamule. And I don't know why it's Yamule and I'm doing the canoe. But that's how that's how panicked I was. I was yelling, Yamule, while I'm in the canoe. Um, Yes. So if it was me and, you know, use us, use somebody else, do it yourself. There wouldn't be a company in the world that didn't put at least 1% of its marketing budget into word of mouth. For sure. It's like a crazy they're not doing it. It is. It is. It at this point, and it's not just us with the data. I mean, you know, because y'all know never to believe agencies and their data because they only <laughs> share data that says we're awesome. But. All the stuff that we do has been 
you know, covered by the press extensively and people have looked at it and, you know, really sarcastic, very difficult people to deal with. The case studies are there. The case studies are there. And there's a whole, I mean, like McKinsey's looked at it and the folks at Chicago's business school and Harvard and Stanford and everybody's looked at that and says, damn, it works. Now, it doesn't, the other cool thing about this, Steve, is that um, it makes all the rest of your marketing much more successful. Because so, it builds on Because it builds, and all your advertising doesn't have to convince, it has to remind. So if everyone's already heard the story of Hoka, and we go out and put a bunch of billboards up to say Hoka on them, then people are like, oh yeah, that's the shoes that Beach wears and always talk about them. And I've seen them four or five places. A couple of people have talked to me. I should really should go check that out. But if 10 years ago we had put up a billboard that said Hoka, everyone's like, um, I don't know, a new dance? Is that some rapper? I mean, I don't know. I don't know what a Hoka is. So if you can get word of mouth and you get the story going, that's why you see so much Pabst billboard stuff now. That's why with Stephanie, we just put up our first billboard and we're about to do radio ads in Augusta, Georgia, because the factory is not far from Augusta. And we're going to do that because we want everybody in the greater Augusta area to come get pecans. You want them to feel like that's a part of their community too, right? They're, it's a part of their community. And y'all, we're, gonna, we're harvesting pecans in September. And the pecans you get in the store, you know... This is said with love, but they could have been in that store for four months and they could have been in the freezer for up to two years beforehand. And this is stuff that, you know, we're shaking the tree, we're putting them in the bag and we're moving them to the sheller and they're moving them to you. Some of this pecans that we'll sell, you know, in the fall for our, we call it first crop, um, they were grown on the tree two weeks ago. So it's a very different experience when you're cooking with but these. But do you want people them. in Augusta to say we're home with the Masters and Stuckies? Sure. We want, we want people to talk about Stuckies all the time. We want people in La Jolla, California. We want people in Augusta, Georgia. We want people to talk about us. And we want to be worthy of their conversation. We want to have stories like Miss Samuels. We want to have stories like Elmer T. We want to have stories about your buddy in Charleston. We have stories just out the wazoo. Uh, Stephanie likes to tell the story. I keep talking to her as I'm not really sure it's super interesting, but uh, George Washington carried pecans in his pocket. So that's what he ate. He ate like, cause they are high nutritional value. And when you're out there and you're on the battlefield, you need some food. So he carried pecans. Pecans are America's. This is kind of interesting for, for me, because but I like to garden. Pecans are America's only native edible nut. Everything else is an invasive species. Brought here by somebody else. Brought here by somebody else. Damn foreigners. Damn foreigners. But, you know, and so like peanuts are from West Africa. Almonds are from Asia. Peanuts are actually pretty good here. Almonds are, and this is not ripping on my friends at the almond industry, because Lord love y'all, one gallon of water a day, every day for 365 days, produces one almond. Whoa. Because it ain't supposed to be here. It's supposed to be somewhere else. Where it's wet. Where it's wet and they got wet feet all the time and all the rest of that stuff. But that was on another part of the world. So people brought them here and you put them in the high desert of California and you just shove a bunch of water in them and they will grow. Pecans, pecans are so native. If anybody who lives down in the Southeast is like, oh yeah, we grandma's got a pecan tree in her yard. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, and it only grows, but where it grows, it, they just grow. And so, pecans. Kind of like azaleas. Uh, kind of like, like azaleas. I mean, they're not quite as flourishing as kudzu, but they're, <laughs> but they're, you know, they're very hardy. And once they get established, I mean, pecan tree will last, will be productive 60, 70, 80, 100 years. So That's it, a long time. It's a really good thing. So if you're worried about carbon footprint or the environment and all the rest of this stuff, you know, Pecans are your pecans are your thing. Tell me another story about another company that you've worked with or working with that can help people. Because most of my people are small entrepreneurial people, right? They're like me. They own small business. They got less than fifty employees. They're doing business in their community. Well, you got anything like that you could tell me about? 
another company. Just to... Besides Hometown Mortgage? Yeah. <laughs> well, so y'all out there that are small, you know, take a napkin, take a piece of paper in your house, and just draw that triangle. I'm going to go story, goal, target, and put activations in the middle. And I'll send you, and you can share with all your audience, I've got a one-page document that showed, that gave basically all the things we've talked about today. It talks about those, and it shows the triangle and all the rest of that stuff. Okay, good. And so if I'm, if I'm a small businessman... And, you know, we were a smaller, I still think I'm a small business person. And it's a pretty big small business at this point, but I'm thinking about it always like that. I'm like, okay, what can I do to just share the conversation about what it is that we do for a living and why it would be important to you? And I just use those opportunities. And so that's how small businesses become medium businesses, become big businesses, right. is because people share the story. And for all of your entrepreneurs out there and all these small businesses, the other great thing is, y'all, don't spend any money on this. I mean, certainly don't call us because y'all will fall over when you find out how much people, <laughs> big companies pay us. Because, of course, they can. They're multiple billions, multiple trillions of dollars worth of business. And so it makes sense for, you know, have a whole fleet of people to come in and help them. Y'all don't need to spend one dollar. You do need to spend your time. Right? So Don't a, spend your money. Spend your time. It's free. Basically, it's free. It is free because you're going to share that stuff. And with social media today, you can go and broadcast all your stuff however you want to do it. So go on YouTube and talk about your orchids that you love or ta or have buy a car and go drive it around. You know, y'all are looking for something where you can be obvious about who you are but not have to run up to people and tell people. Let people come to you. Americans are smart. We're the smartest, most educated, wealthiest individuals in the entire world. Y'all don't, you don't have to chase any of us down. We get you. We need to know about what it is. We need to understand how that would be important to us. And then let us make the decisions for us. We don't need anybody to go chase us down. We don't need anybody to stick a flyer in our mailbox. We know when it's time to vote. We know when we have kids that we got to get them a high chair. We know when we turn 65 that we got to get Medicare. We don't need we don't need somebody to flood our mailbox and come choose me, come choose me. We'll figure this out. Particularly, you can go on the internet, right? There's nothing that an advocate can't tell you that you can't find on the internet. Yeah, there's nothing. But we don't have, with 14,000 commercial messages, so not only do you get 14,000 commercial messages, each individual North American today makes right around 20,000 different decisions every day. Every day? Every day. Left, right, what shoes, what am I wearing, am uh, I cold? Think about all the things. Think about all the decisions y'all make every day. I'm cold, should I get, my wife is like, should I take a sweater? What is the temperature? I need to go look at what the temperature is going to be after dinner. You know, all the rest of these things she's doing. She doesn't have time to have somebody jump up to them and say, Hey, Jimmy Redcorn, yo, head like bird, go Jimmy Redcorn, you know? But I'm going to come home and I'm going to say, Hey, there's this place up in Alpharetta. Is, it, is your liquor store called Reds? Yeah. That's what you said. And I need to, um, and I stopped by on my way back from Beach's house. And I got a couple bottles, and I'm going to take one up to where I went to. I went to Underrad up in the middle of Virginia, and I'm going to take a bottle because we got a board meeting in August, and I'm going to share it with a bunch of people, right? Because I know, because we've all been drinking bourbon, you know, since we were going to school there in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And so I know I'm going to have an audience, and I'm going to say, well, this tastes different, and I'm going to tell you a story about the red corn. I'm going to tell you a story about, you know, it's only corn. And that's why it tastes different. And some people are going to like it and some people aren't. People do love it, are going to love it. And people not are going to go back to drinking the bottles of Wello 12 and Booker's and all and Knob Creek and all the other stuff that we got hidden up there because we're a bunch of reprobates that like to go up and <laughs> hang out at school and relive the old days and drink much better bourbon than we did back in the back when we were in school there. Bubba, thank you.
Thank you for being here. Steve, I appreciate it. Thank you. Man, thank you for having thank me. Thank you a bunch. This is good. No, it's my pleasure. You know, anytime y'all, just so you know, if you ever want me to come over to your house and sit around in front of a light, <laughs> you just need you to buy the Elmer T and buy all this and I'll bring some pecans. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Fred. Great. Appreciate you. Thank y'all for being here for another podcast. Till next time, beaching out.